Hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Bai. I'm the Director of Programming at MCA Denver. Welcome to the final part in our four-part series on Keith Haring that we're producing in conjunction with our current exhibition, Keith Haring Grace House Murals. Check out our YouTube channel for videos of the exhibition if you want to get a peek inside. MCA is coming to you live every Wednesday throughout the run of our exhibitions. Check out all the great program we have coming up at mcadenver.org slash events. We are glad to be able to present this programming during the pandemic and glad that you're joining us. If you have the means, please consider donating to support MCA Denver. We suggest a donation of $10, but of course, any amount helps. Thank you so much for your support. Today we present Keith Haring, Witness, AIDS and Activism. Our host for this series, Carla McCormick, will join for the question and answer. Carlo is an American culture critic, writer, and curator living in New York City. We have three special guests today. Ginny Liotta is a filmmaker, artist, and professor of moving image arts at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Jim Hubbard is a filmmaker who's been making films since 1974. His film, United in Anger, is currently available to screen at the Denver Film Society's virtual cinema. Sarah Shulman is a novelist, playwright, screenwriter, nonfiction writer, and AIDS historian. Her 20th book, Let the Record Show, A Political History of Act Up, will be published in May. Please welcome Jeannie, Jim, and Sarah. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much, Sarah. Happy to be here. I'm Jeannie Liotta, a New Yorker born and raised and uh, living in the East Village since 1980. And now I'm teaching at CU Boulder, where at the moment I'm teaching a grad seminar in art and film in the era of AIDS. So I bring my students here into the room with us today. Uh, they're behind me. I wanted to start just before we meet our guests with a little background on Keith Haring and his um, final years and the work that he was making. So can we have the slides? And to begin by remembering that <clears throat> at the height of his fame, Keith Haring's fame, uh, this really coincided with the height of the AIDS epidemic in the United States, right? This was a time of mainstream homophobia, the culture wars, the religious right, the moral majority, when censorship and misinformation were rampant. So um, Herring was diagnosed with AIDS in 1988, and he dedicated the rest of his short life to creating art that generated awareness about the AIDS epidemic. He established his foundation in 89 to provide funding and imagery for HIV education and research and care. He was 31 years old when he died of complications from AIDS in February 1990. So all the images that I've uh, pulled for us to look at today, I just want to mention uh, most of them I found on the site that's called Visual AIDS. Um, uh, Visual AIDS is the main arts organization that's committed to assisting artists living with HIV and AIDS and preserving and honoring the work of artists with HIV AIDS and their the uh, general cultural and artistic contributions to the AIDS movement, really important. So we begin here with this image, um, 1982. This is the earliest image I've pulled for us, vinyl paint on tarp, and we see um, the radiant lines surrounding the figures, which we're of course used to seeing with the radiant baby and the barking dog, and this is a signature of Keith's. But here we're looking, of course, at two men in a radiant embrace, two lovers. Uh, next slide, please. By 1985, Keith says, things have seriously changed in New York and in my life because of the horror of AIDS that had come to light. And in this piece from 85, we see one of the first times he's using a slogan in his works, safe sex. And we see these two figures marked by the X, right? This target, that target could be viral infection. It could be gay bashing. It could be governmental neglect. This is something we see again and again in his works. And next slide, please. Uh, different variation on the same theme, this however being acrylic on canvas, which was made for an auction to benefit the gay men's health crisis. There was some concern at the time that um, this image uh, represented two male stick figures stroking each other and possibly the New York Times would not see fit to print it in their newspaper. Next slide, please. Untitled 1988. Next slide, please. Um, some promotional images uh, we know 
from earlier talks that uh, Keith Haring started the Pop Shop, which was a commercial venture in which he was able to sell many different kinds of uh, objects and swag, let's call it, with uh, his images printed on them. And of course you could get t-shirts, magnets, buttons, and condoms at the Pop Shop. Here's an example of one of the condom cases. Next slide, please. Uh, here's another one, Debbie Dick for president, more balls than Bush, of course, referring to um, the changeover in presidents from Reagan to Bush. Um, <clears throat> the uh, penis in drag, we might, we might refer to this as, or uh, which has also been referred to in art form as a feminized erection, very popular figure on the condom cases for Keith Haring. Uh, next slide. And then some licensed imagery. Of course, uh, many organizations can license uh, imagery from the Herring Foundation. Here we see a condom case for the benefit of Planned Parenthood. Next slide. Uh, this is a t-shirt that is produced by the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS, Pediatric AIDS Foundation. Next slide and some cards that were made for the AIDS hotline in English and in Spanish. I personally remember seeing these in phone booths in New York at the time, just kind of stuck in the edges of the phone booth if anyone needed it. Next slide. And this is a guide for teens. And in this image we see um, the three figures that are also recurrent in a lot of Herring's work, the hear no evil, speak no evil, and see no evil. Next slide. And these same figures again, now in the service of imagery made for ACT UP. These three figures, dissimilar to the last three figures we saw, each are targeted. Ignorance equals fear, silence equals death, fight AIDS, ACT UP with the ACT UP uh, triangle, the symbol uh, logo of ACT UP. And for those who uh, may not know, ACT UP stands for the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. We're gonna talk about that today with our guests. Uh, an organization started in 1987, grassroots activism and direct action. Next slide, please. And another ACT UP image in the uh, black and white line drawing, again with the figures, with the targets. Uh, next slide. So in the uh, summer of 89, Keith Aaron created the site-specific mural. I thought this was interesting to bring in, considering that we have a site-specific work at the MCA Denver right now. Um, this mural was entitled Once Upon a Time, and this was made uh, for the center show in the men's room of the Lesbian and Gay Community Services Center, where many ACT UP meetings took place. Next slide. And here we have a detail of the same, uh, which interestingly incorporates the actual plumbing of that bathroom. Uh, all these line, line drawings decorating the entire men's bathroom in a, in a celebration of a liberated gay sexuality, a fever dream of homosexual coupling, which uh, sadly was now just a memory in the era of AIDS. Next slide. Uh, one of the last images that uh, Herring made in his lifetime, uh, appropriating the logo of that pink triangle, again, the logo of ACT UP with a multiplicity of over overlapping, see no evil, hear no evil bodies. The pink triangle, of course, had been uh, used by the Nazis to identify homosexuals, much as the yellow star identified Jews. And we wear the pink triangle today as a reminder of the past and a pledge that history will not repeat itself. Next slide. Um, here is the neon sign that was made for the new museum show, Let the Record Show in, in 1987, organized by Grand Fury, which was one of the more high profile of the artist activist affinity groups of ACT UP. Um, next slide, please. And here is a view from the street, uncomfortable with the gesture of bringing activist artworks inside the museum, thereby possibly robbing them of their energy as agitprop. Uh, Grand Fury agreed to use the window space of the museum, which was then located on Broadway only. So this work was there for any passersby to see for all of New York and anyone who visited. 
Okay, and that's the end of my quick slideshow, just bring us up to date with ACT UP. And uh, again, briefly, before I introduce our guests for today, Jim Hubbard and Sarah Schulman, I want to uh, bring up the trailer for United in Anger from 2012, this film, which as Sarah mentioned, you can see as part of the virtual cinema of the Denver Film Society. Uh, let's watch the trailer. Living in New York at that time was like crazy because people were getting sick every day. Three, four, five, six people that you hear about being sick. We were very scared that the Reagan administration was going to put people with AIDS in internment camps. And I think that we came close to that in this country. How deeply are Americans worried about AIDS? A Los Angeles Times poll found that 50% of Americans favor quarantine for AIDS victims. 15% said AIDS victims should be tattooed. It was about people in power not caring about the lives of people who didn't have power. Kramer delivered a fiery speech and I remember he asked uh, like half of the audience to stand up and he said, you're all going to be dead in six months. Now what are we going to do about it? to unleash power. We are a diverse, nonpartisan group of individuals united in anger and committed to direct action to end the AIDS crisis. Release those drugs! Release those drugs! When we're activists, when we really act up, we have a big impact and we get what we're demanding and when we're silent, we don't. We'll never be silent again! Act up! We'll never be silent again! Act up! where I really got a sense of community. I mean, I got the feeling then that people felt that lives depended on them. Healthcare is the right! Healthcare is the right! I don't fight back! Fight it! These drug companies are profiteering on our lives and that we cannot accept that anymore. Wonderful. Hi. Welcome, Sarah and Jim. Thank you. It's great to see yeah. you, Jeannie. Yeah. You too. Thanks for having us. Yeah, for sure. I love that trailer so much. It's really great. Um, I hope everybody goes to see the film. We, of course, watched that on day one of our class, I just want to say. And we also have been reading Sarah's book, Gentrification of the Mind, her last book, um, all about the era. So my students are um, very interested. And they really suggested, first of all, that we begin at the beginning. So make sure that everybody's on the same page since the whole audience hasn't taken the class. <laughs> and maybe you could talk a little bit about the beginnings of ACT UP and how that all started. Okay, well, let's just start a little bit with the beginning of AIDS. So, yeah. so, so what we think now is that AIDS first manifested in humans uh, in the Congo at the turn of the century, the last century, when Belgians were colonizing and were pushing people into the woods. And in their, they, because they were away from their food source, people were killing monkeys and eating them. And that may be where AIDS first entered into the human. Um, we have uh, evidence of AIDS in the United States in, as far back as 1940s, and certainly in the 60s and 70s. So by the time science finally realized the pattern, which is around 1981, we think that at that point, 200,000 people were already infected in the United States. So for the first five years, uh, 40,000 people died in America, and the government did absolutely nothing. The only Medications were failed cancer drugs whose patents were owned by pharmaceutical companies. And they would re try to recycle those drugs and AZT was one of those drugs. Mm -hmm. And so there was no structure to research and there was no way for people to get into, into experimental trials. And primarily this is because the number one communities that were affected were marginalized communities, gay and bisexual men, 
dr IV drug users, um, Haitians, partners of IV drug users, low income women. So people who really had no power. And I just wanna remind everybody that in 1981, there was an, gay people were a despised minority that had absolutely no protection. Mm -hmm. So homosexuality was illegal. Even in New York City, you, there was no anti-discrimination bill. You could be fired from your job. You could be kicked out of your apartment. You could be kicked out of a restaurant for being gay. It wasn't until 2003 that gay sex was decriminalized in the United States. So you have to keep that in mind when you look at the yeah. historical context. So um, after the first five years, which were very chaotic and people were scrambling, and you have to remember that Familial homophobia was a huge force of history and was very dominant in this period. So basically, people with AIDS had to take care of each other. There was no, the society that was made up of the families of people with AIDS were completely indifferent and neglectful. And so there were lots of little organizations that were set up just to try to get people groceries or to try to help people clean their house or walk their dogs or there was gay men's health crisis that had a buddy system. But the political movement didn't really start until 1987. And the catalyst was a speech by the writer Larry Kramer at the Gay and Lesbian Center uh, where he just scared everybody and he said, look to the right of you, look at the left of you, in five years half of you will be dead. Um, and then people in the audience decided that they wanted to continue meeting. Two days later, they met, and somebody, uh, Steve Bohr was his name, had the idea for the name ACT UP, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. And that's how it began. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, Jim, um, you had mentioned that actually a few years before, there was in Denver a meeting and some principles were drawn up called the Denver Principles. I wonder if this is a good moment for that. Yeah, it seems like a perfect moment. Yeah. Um, so in a sense, AIDS activism began in Denver. In June of 1983, the fifth lesbian and gay health conference took place in Denver, and a group of about 10 um, people with AIDS met in a hotel room and drafted what we now know as the Denver Principles. And so this is the first time that um, People with AIDS asserted that they were not victims. Uh, they were only patients some of the time, but they were always people with AIDS. And that people with AIDS should control the movement. And and so this, this document actually changed the relationship of everyone in the United States to medical care and, you know, and probably the world. Um, and for because for the first time, people with a disease were taking control of it and asserting their, their own right to, to be in, con, in control of, all, of their lives in all, in all aspects of it. Mm. Okay, great. To die and live with dignity. It's interesting how you, um, you know, you mentioned that people want taking control of their own destinies in a sense, or, or and I really think that for my students, reading about ACT UP and understanding that this was an organization in which there was no leader, for example, right? And the way that that was organized and you know, very horizontally, that everyone was contributing an equal basis, it was, was mind blowing, right? So maybe talk a little bit, if you would, about, um, the organization of ACT UP and what affinity groups were, and maybe that can lead us into talking about how cultural production was an important part of that as well, right? Okay, well, contrary to where we are today, yeah. uh, ACT UP practiced radical democracy. And let me tell you that this was not a theoretical position that they decided on. In fact, ACT UP never theorized itself. It just did things because it was a state of emergency. It was a movement of people with AIDS who had immediate needs. They knew what those needs were and those were the immediate goals. And then, so from the, their actions, their values emerged. And so the way it ended up being structured without being decided was that basically people could do whatever they wanted as long as it met the one, one line statement of unity, which was direct action to end the AIDS crisis. 
So that meant direct action, not social service provision. Mm -hmm. And if what you were doing was direct action to end the AIDS crisis, you could do it. Now, one of the really great things about ACT UP is that it did not practice consensus. So for example, if you wanted to go on the Lower East Side and uh, agitate for legal needle exchange, and I didn't want to, I wouldn't try to stop you from doing it. I just wouldn't do it. If instead I wanted to interrupt mass at St. Patrick's Cathedral and you want you didn't want to do that, you just wouldn't do it. So there wasn't this thing about trying to control everybody and trying to make everybody have the same analysis mm -hmm. or the same strategy. None of that was present. The, the loose structure was that there was a Monday night meeting where it would be maybe three to 700 people would gather in the Lesbian and Gay Center and later Cooper Union. And there were committees that you, official committees of ACT UP that you could be on, like the Media Committee, the Actions Committee, the Majority Action Committee, which is for people of color and ACT UP. Um, and those committees all had one representative that they sent to the coordinating committee, except that the Women's Committee had two, so that well, that woman would not be the only woman on the coordinating <laughs> committee. And they didn't call themselves a steering committee because they, they didn't want to be steered. So that was the official structure. There were facilitators in front of the room who were elected by the floor and they would run the meetings. However, there was a very large unofficial structure, which were affinity groups, which are small groups of maybe 10 to 20 people who would meet on their own time in their own places and plan their own actions, many of which were illegal to support larger actions that ACT UP was officially doing. And this, they did not have to get approval from the larger group. And in this way, they were protected because we felt that ACT UP was infiltrated by the police. <coughs> and in fact, in my new book, I do reproduce FBI files that show there were many informers in ACT UP. We don't know who they were, but um, that was a legitimate concern. Mm -hmm. And so you had an official and unofficial structure. <coughs> Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Um, you use the term the floor, which I, I just want to like go back to for a minute because that refers to like the general public that was in the meeting. Anyone, right? Right. Yeah. Technically there was a there was a request that you not vote until you had been to three meetings, but there was no bureaucracy. So nobody actually followed up on that. And you know, one of the things in ACT UP um, that I always like to share with people is for example, somebody in the front of the room would say, we need someone to write a letter to this commissioner. And somebody would say, I'll do it. And then nobody would ever check up on them again. So there would be none of this group sitting around the paper saying you need a comma here. They just did it. You know, people were just trusted to go forward because the people in ACT UP needed to survive and mm -hmm. they were motivated. Yeah, awesome. And yeah, um, maybe talking about, Jim, you could say something about the, uh, Grand Fury and other media groups, because you know one of the things my students noticed was how much footage there is in in United in Anger. I mean, we should talk about the oral history as well. But just thinking about you as a camera person, carrying your camera around all over the place, and maybe you could talk about all of that—the media savvy aspect of the ACT UP. Oh, okay. Well, you know, first of all, it's not it's not my foot all of my footage in mm -hmm. United. Anger. And in fact, there's very little of my own footage because ACT UP, I guess, probably was the, the first movement that um, was able to document itself in such a um, uh, extended fashion. Um, there's a collection at the New York Public Library that I put together, the AIDS activist video collection, which has over a thousand hours mm -hmm. of AIDS activist footage. Um, and that was possible because People got together in collectives, in groups, and and did the um, did the work that, that made that possible. So testing the limits, which is the first one, had six members. So they had they would have they usually worked in groups of two. So there would be three cameras at a um, at a demonstration, and they would they would edit collectively. Mm -hmm. And then uh, later on. There was uh, Diva TV, Damned Interfering Video Activist Television, um, which was even a larger group. At times, there were as many as 40 people. So there, there would be, in an ACT UP demonstration, there would be people with video cameras um, all, you know, just all over the place documenting as much of it as possible. Mm -hmm. and, um, so there's that collection of the New York Public Library. And 
I'm working on a new website for the ACT UP Oral History Project, um, actuporalhistory.org, uh, which will not only have our, we have 187 interviews. They range from an hour to four hours long. And those, the complete videos will be on the website and we, along with transcripts and a clip from each of the interviews. But beyond that, there'll be, there'll be AIDS activist video footage from, from the New York Public Library collection so that people will be able to see what everybody's talking about. So you collected all of that footage. I mean, it's one thing for people to like show up with cameras, right? But it's another thing to actually get that footage. That's well, the hardest. Yeah, you know, but it was really strange. So the, the height of ACT UP is 1987 to 1993. And most of the video work is taking place in that period. But by 1995, it all seemed like it was in the past. It was under people's beds and in their closets. And um, Patrick Moore, who was running the estate project for artists with AIDS at that time, realized that it was going to be lost if we didn't do something to collect it. Mm -hmm. So um, they actually they hired me to do the work, and I I had to convince <laughs> forty very recalcitrant people um, to donate their footage to the New York Public Library so that it could be safely um, stored, preserved, um, and um, access provided. Um, and the, the one thing that convinced them is that they could keep the copyright. So the, the library does not own the copyright, the, the individual makers do. Yeah, I was going to ask what the uh, problem was, right? Oh, God, when people email me and ask, oh, I want to use that shot from, and I say, yes, well, here are the names and email addresses of the six people you have to get permission from <laughs> <laughs> in order to to use it in your film. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing we uh, see in United in Anger that's so, you know, for a documentary, I think it's worth pointing out that there's no voiceover explaining anything to you about, you know, this is what this meant and this is what that meant, right? We're, we're hearing people's own voices and a lot of those voices are interviews from the uh, oral history, is that correct? The, um, all the interviews are from the ACT UP Oral History Project. Mm -hmm. and. Um, there are there are some interviews that were shot at, in the '80s and '90s and are included in the film. But um, yeah, and um, so so there's that. But also, you know, as you said, there's Grand Fury, and there were other artist collectives also making work, making all those incredible posters for ACT UP. Uh, yeah. So it, it, yeah, I think it was really important. There are lots of artists, writers were involved in the um, in the movement. But it's also, you know, it's a movement of ordinary people. So I guess one thing I always say about um, Keith Haring, and I think um, it's true that, you know, all these artists, writers, filmmakers were ordinary members of, um, of ACT UP, but Keith was an ordinary me member of ACT UP, the one who could write a $10,000 check to, uh, to rent buses to go to a demonstration. So. And he did. And he did. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good piece of news. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's interesting you're talking about the, um, you know, the posters. I mean, I, I have very strong memories of seeing the buses go by with the um, kissing doesn't kill posters on them. You know, I mean, this was part of our visual culture, just every, every citizen of New York City saw this every single day, right? And of course, you know, New York is famous for street culture, as we call it. But I mean, I think it's important to think about that as like a very serious part of communication. It was before the internet. I mean, you know, this is something that students have, we have to remind them, you couldn't send an email. How did you get in touch with people? You, you put posters up on the walls and that's still true, right? To a certain degree today. Um, but I was thinking a lot about how in some ways the, um, demonstrations, the bringing, it, it bringing our bodies out into the streets and getting our bodies involved was also taking place in art and activism. Like these things were very, very closely aligned in a way that I've maybe never seen it in my lifetime. And I mean, this has informed me as an artist, um, you know, perpetually, this I the idea that art and politics are actually not separate things. They, they, they come together. Um, I just, had to put that out there and wonder if, if you concur with that experience. Oh, I'm, no, I'm glad you said that.
because well, you and I are experimental filmmakers. And I, you know, when I started making experimental film, the, the, that kind of politics was really excluded mm. from, from it. Mm. I mean, there was this notion that structuralist film was somehow political uh, mm. because it, it was different from, from Hollywood movies. Uh -huh. but, but if you actually talked about social action, if you talked about politics, if, if you, you know, that, that was not um, something that was acceptable to the previous generation. Mm, right, they, that was for video makers. Yeah, right. yes, right. <laughs> I mean, I guess that was the old argument, but you know, one can understand on certain levels how, you know, video was more aligned with like media, right? It was, it was immediate. You went out and you could just like make an image right away, which was not true for film. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, one of the things, of course, we, we talk about when we look at the films and videos of that era and we're looking at, you know, both film and video. I mean, this is not a question anymore. It's all media. It's all moving image. But of course, people working in um, film were really investigating the material properties of film. You know, we talk about handmade work. But I, I think that we were very concerned with mortality because it was everywhere. You know, it was in the air that we breathed. And I feel like even though the subject matter of some works weren't specifically pointing to AIDS, that still the AIDS era is imbued in many artworks that we wouldn't normally think. So just kind of thinking oh, through that. I, mean, I don't want to exclude, you know, the, um, the abstract part, part of art. Yeah. But, but to follow up on that, you know, the, um, in, in a way it's quite ironic that I'm, you know, become sort of the... Um, um, I don't know, the gateway to all this material, because there, there was that distinction in, in those days between the filmmaker and, and the video maker. And it was especially true in my case, because I processed my own film. Mm -hmm. So I could go out and shoot something, but I might not even be able to see it for eight months till I got enough to go and process. And, and those video makers, they, you know, they went back to the, ed the editing um, room right after the demonstration and started um, editing their, their videos and they could have a video out about the demonstration the next day. Right, right. Yeah, really awesome. Um, I'm saying, I'm smiling as I'm thinking about this, right? Even though it's such a serious subject, but one of the things also that's so clear when we watch the film and, and read the book for all of the um, difficulties and sorrows of the time, that there was a lot of joy that was involved. I mean, we see this in the ACT UP demonst demonstrations, anger, yes, but joy and in the meetings too. And I wonder about that, if, if you wanna say anything about that. Well, I think, you know, mo movements only work if they make people's lives better for being mm -hmm. in them. And, you know, as Emma Goldman famously said, if I can't dance, it's not my revolution. <laughs> so if, you, if a movement is asking people to bear a burden out of guilt or responsibility alone, it will not succeed. Mm -hmm. And ACT UP was a way of life. I mean, so many people that we interviewed spent all of their time in ACT UP. They lived with people from ACT UP. They got jobs from people with ACT UP. Uh, affinity groups, if a member of an affinity group got sick, sometimes that group would become the care group. You know, it was, it was a collective way of living and, and also dying. And even today, people who really disagreed with each other politically in ACT UP are very deeply bonded. I mean, because, because ACT UP was successful and there's very, to a degree, and there's very few political movements in America that actually are able to make achieve a paradigm shift in the way that ACT UP did. And, and so we know, those of us who are in ACT UP, we know that it's possible. And you know we're bonded by that, and we, we we're trying to bring that knowledge. So you know, in the in my new book about ACT UP, I'm trying to cohere what were the strategies that worked, why did they work, what did not work, why mm. didn't it work. Jim and I have never been interested in nostalgia. That's never been our project. It's always been about inspiring and supporting contemporary activists and trying to give them a leg up because it's very hard to get the information of activist history. It's something that's really hidden. Absolutely. I mean, this came up in my class as well. Students who consider themselves informed about politics were like, wait a minute, how come we didn't learn about this? Why didn't, why don't we know? 
right? Oh, and I think, go ahead. Yeah, uh, one point, Jim and I went to the uh, some national convention of historians to try to get them to put AIDS in 20th century US history classes. And the only people who showed up were other gay people. It was a fail, you know, but yes, this has, this is a central theme of American life. And it really deserves that, that place. Yeah. Especially for all the success, you know, and I, I think you're, you're quoted in your, I quote you now in your book where you talked about how you went and spoke to a group and you said they did not know that they could change the world, right? Okay. We have this idea as Americans for some reason that, you know, you can't fight City Hall. Right, but that's a rumor being spread by City Hall. That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so yeah, really, really uh, so key for people to understand that they're, you know, the world does get changed certainly by any and everyday people. But and one of the complications of that is that people's strategy for how to achieve change is really predicated on their social position. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the discoveries that I made as I was writing this history. You know, that, um, for example, Larry Kramer went to Yale with the head of Bristol Myers. So okay. he could call him up and they could get a meeting and he could bring another ACT UP guy who went to Harvard and another guy who was at JP Morgan and they could arrive at the pharmaceutical company and get um, a catered lunch. Mm -hmm. But when the women of color uh, and, and women with HIV tried to get the definition of AIDS changed to reflect women's special symptoms, they it took them two years to even get a meeting. So they had to use all other different kinds of strategies. And that's very important to understand that the more further away you are from power, the messier your, your, your approach is going to be. And mm -hmm. the longer it's gonna take and the harder it's going to be. One of the mm -hmm. groups that act up that had the messiest history of all was the, the groups of IV drug users yeah. who successfully won needle exchange in New York City and saved endless amounts of lives. But when you look at their stories, they're people who OD'd and died in ACT UP. There were people who stole money from ACT UP. I mean, they were messy, but mm -hmm. you know, they won. So you, anybody can win, but you have to take different approaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really good information. I mean, for the new generation of queers, and maybe we wanna talk about that a little bit, right? Because I think uh, you, you tell some interesting stories in the book about going to, um, an art opening, you know, and having like the older generation of queers and the younger generation and that what's that conversation between generations and how can we keep this information alive and not not uh, descend into nostalgia, I guess. Well, I mean, also the formation has changed so dramatically. I mean, the reason that initially there was an autonomous gay movement, a separate gay movement was because nobody else would have us. You know, there's a long history of left-wing movements kicking out gay people and they didn't want us and that's why there was a gay movement but today it's completely different every main every progressive movement in this country has openly queer and trans people in leadership whether it's mm -hmm. black lives matter whether it's the dreamers whether it's palestine solidarity mm -hmm. wherever you go you know so it's really it's the way that queer liberation lives is much healthier now and much more integrated mm. Good it's point. Because it will always was that way, except that they had the it, queer people. They were in the closet. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. I guess that's uh. excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Um, hmm. Getting back to the bodies, and this brings up the body. I just want to go back to the bodies in the streets because oh. um, aside from the demonstration, I mean, including the demonstrations, but I'm also thinking about people like Herring uh, who were making their art in the streets, you know, and how like these things came together. And you have that beautiful piece of footage I know of Keith at the ACT UP demonstrations. And Carlo had mentioned when we were speaking like, well, you know, he, he wasn't just making art, he was bringing his body into the street. And of course that's where he started, right? He started in the street, that the art grew out of the streets of the city as did the demonstrations. And to me, that's really, really important. Also for Sarah in your book, talking about what, what is the life of a community, the life of a neighborhood, who are we together with each other and, and keeping that foremost in our minds, right? Um, yeah, can we, can we show the little um, snippet? Should we take yeah, a look at some of that footage? Okay. That would be great. Yeah, because if you don't have 
I mean, if you don't if you don't have money in a city, you can't. You know, it's an expensive disease. People that can't, if you can't get, you know, money to get your ACT or to get whatever you have, you don't. You know, people just give up. And most most people don't even. You know, the kind of healthcare you get if you go to a, public, a hospital emergency room or if you go to that the you know kind of public um, healthcare that you can get here is like almost non-existent. Hey! Incredible. There he is, just being an ordinary act up member. And it's interesting that little interview. I mean, what what happened to Keith and his his two friends, his little entourage, were just in the picket line going round and round. Mm -hmm. And the guy with the microphone, who actually was Ray Navarro, um, you know, shoved the microphone first in, in Keith's friend's face, and he he couldn't say anything, and so that's why Keith kind of grabbed the microphone and, and, and said something. But, awesome. you know, that's that's what it was like. Everyone could be a spokesperson in ACT UP. And it, um, especially because all this information was 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 given, you know, brought to the meeting and, and disseminated. Mm -hmm. So um, every meeting, there was this, this huge table about 30 feet long just filled with with um, Xerox copies of, of all this information about everything to do with, with the AIDS crisis. And there were teachings about various subjects. Um, and, and so, you know, like whole weekends devoted to disseminating knowledge about various aspects of, of the AIDS epidemic. Yeah, as things were changing so quickly, right? I mean, over time, Things changed, new knowledge came up, right? I mean, different drugs were being tried and um, where else to get that info? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about yeah, it even, go ahead. Oh, cause you know, we had 187 people over 18 years. And one of the things that was really interesting Uh oh. <laughs> She's freezing. Informed, but it's not like a cult, you know. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, you froze there for a second, but I think we're back on track. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, it's all right. Okay. <laughs> well, look, I wonder if it's uh, maybe a moment here to um, see if there's any questions from our listeners that are out there that we can't see. We know you're there. <laughs> we're happy you're there but we have no view of you um, with our the last- Weirdness of technology. Yeah, hi, Carlo. That was really amazing, everyone. And I do Thanks. encourage people, this is incredible to have uh, you here. So I encourage people to try to write in some questions, but uh, I'm gonna be greedy and maybe ask something myself because a lot of what you spoke about to me is of course really resonant uh, at this time of uh, a more activist culture. And it reminds me uh, very much of like this, almost like turning of a switch uh, because we had the culture wars and we had so many people in our community dying and fighting for their lives that while we had political art and Keith was doing plenty of things, uh, rock against racism and anti-nuke mm -hmm. stuff, we had that stuff, but uh, uh, we didn't, a lot of the radicalisms of the 60s had failed by this point for our generation. This is uh, maybe, the question is whether you think I'm crazy or not. But the, a lot of us you know, weren't, uh, we were political, but we were very far from activists. And then all of a sudden you see all these artists and all these writers and all these different figures of the creative community uh, really becoming activists and the art changes. Uh, am I nuts? Well, I, I don't totally agree because there was, of course, the women's movement and gay liberation, right, in the 70s. So, but it did move away from like straight people, from the white students, from people who were involved in the mass movements of the 60s. Many of them did, did deactivate, but there were other formations that were being created. Yeah, there were. But I mean, I think in New York, it was sort of like if you're keeping track of what the old left of like Lucy Lepard and Hans Hacke and people like that were doing, it was like, they were kind of going to Nicaragua and <laughs> documenting, you know, American imperialism uh, gestures around the world. And they're like, 
we were living in a city with people like ODing on your doorstep and mm. in, in such extreme poverty. I think that the the left got disconnected and then somehow in the mid 80s with the culture wars and with the, the, the huge health crisis mm. that, yeah, people like me who had stepped aside, sorry, Sarah, I don't have your virtue of history, but we all got a little more interested. And I think it's really interesting to see how that happens in the arts. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, I have a question here uh, for Sarah. Uh, what do we think the handling of the COVID-19 pandemic by the U.S. government illuminate about the AIDS epidemic? Mm. Well, I think that there's one dramatic similarity and one dramatic difference. So the difference is that COVID is a public collective event. It's on TV every night. It's being discussed in the newspaper. You all know about it. AIDS was considered a private problem because mm. the people who had it didn't matter. And our fight was to try to get into the public sphere. That was so much of what our battle was. So that's a very different kind of experience. Where, where they overlap is that any cataclysm in America reveals all the fissures of the society. So, you know, COVID like AIDS primarily hits poor people, uh, black and brown people. It you know, it, it reveals the problems of our unequal health care system. So in that way, it resonates very strongly. Yeah. Jim, do you, do you see those kind of... Uh... Oh, yeah. No, that's, that's absolutely um, the, the, the way it is. I mean, I, I, when I was watching the, um, the trailer, I was just thinking, you know, people screaming, you know, health care is a right. Americans still don't believe that. And I, you know, I said at the beginning of, of the COVID epidemic that um, if this doesn't convince Americans that we need single payer healthcare, nothing will. Um, and and so, you know, just it, the um, also the, the the drug situation is 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 very similar where. Um, where these vaccines, which were actually developed by the U.S. government, developed at the National Institutes of Health, mm. you know, are are given to the the drug companies to, to make, you know make huge amounts of money for it. Because the the drug companies, all they do is figure out how to mass, not mass market, but but to 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 make it on a on a mass level. All the basic research is done. Um, courtesy of the, the U.S. government. Um, and so, you know, that's the same way with the, with the, with the AIDS medicines. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and people, we've got four vaccines now, or five vaccines for COVID. Do we have vaccines for AIDS? No, but, uh, you know, you know, maybe this will, you know, all it would take is a few billion dollars. You know, it's, it's a matter <laughs> It's a matter of political will. It's not, the technology is there. Mm -hmm. and, and there's an amazing overlap also between the figure like Fauci or something like that, people who were deeply invested in, in uh, the AIDS crisis. Well, I'm so <laughs> glad you brought that up because, you know, <laughs> the second coming of Anthony Fauci is a really interesting <laughs> phenomena. In, in my book that's coming out, um, you can see that actually, Anthony Fauci opposed or obstructed almost every innovation that ACT UP tried to bring forward. I mean, I interview people saying like, Richard Elovich went to Fauci and said, what about drug users? And he's like, oh no, they're not, they don't cooperate, forget about them. The women were like, what about women? And he's like, no, 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 no. Uh, Jim Igo designed parallel tracks so people could get access to treatments and Fauci took a really long time to be brought around. We had to surround his office and people trash his office and put things in his files and we had to scream at him. And finally he came around. But now it's, he's being presented as though he was like Jesus. And it's really interesting. And my theory is that it's because Larry Kramer died and mm -hmm. that people need a white man to be the hero. And so mm -hmm. he has been the new hero. You know, but actually the heroes of AIDS were many, 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 many people from many different communities working at the same time. And that's the answer as to how you make change. As Jim points out, and I quote him saying this in my book, the idea of the heroic individual 
who you know leads a movement to change is like based on John Wayne movies. Mm. It's not really how things work. Mm. In America, change happens from coalitions. Mm -hmm. And that's always been true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, Fauci's great talent actually is is political. He um he he's the master of speaking out of both sides of his mouth. I mean, Trump really tested that ability. But my first memory of Fauci is when he went before well, first of all, he said to act up that, you know, we need all the money we can, we can get from Congress. And then he goes to testify before Congress and says, no, 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 we have all the money we need. And, you know, and that's that's the, the whole the um, the way his his career has been for 40 years. Mm -hmm. okay, Jim and I were invited to the to the NIH um, and we went. This was many, you know, after we had started the Active Oral History Project. And you know, this time we weren't outside screaming at them. They actually let us in and we gave like a little talk. And this woman raised her hand and she's like, I'm the librarian. And when you all demonstrated here, I went out and collected leftover signs and saved them for archival purposes. And we're all so grateful that Dr. Fauci was wise enough to give everybody a seat at the table. And Jim and I we were just like so upset. And we were mm -hmm. like, our friends fought until the day they died to force Fauci to do mm -hmm. that. And that is the true history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, these myths, uh, you know, whether they're purely American or not, I don't I don't really, I'm not gonna get into the deep analysis, but to, just to say like, it's the same way in the art world, right? I mean, we have these ideas that like, this person is the one when, you know, it's, it's a zeitgeist most of the time. That's a huge amount of people that are all producing and influencing, influencing each other. And we, we pluck out these individuals to be these heroes, right? right. And this, I think, getting- <laughs> That's why we're here. That's right. Because you know, Keith was picked, you know, picked out. That's right. So, you know, thanks Keith for uh, providing us this opportunity. <laughs> well, it's also, I mean, that you were, you're raising a really interesting question, Jim. And I also think about this in relation to David Wanarovich. Mm -hmm. You know, certain individuals, we, Jeannie and Carlo and Jim and I were part of a community of thousands of artists. Mm -hmm. You know, and people get picked out as emblematic often because they produce commodity objects. Mm -hmm. And those objects are often owned by people who are on boards of various museums and galleries and stuff like that. And then they become these emblematic figures that in their day they were not. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you went back to our time and I said, like, who is the most important gay artist? I mean, people would have said Jack Smith. Right. Or someone like that. They wouldn't have said David Wanarovich, even though mm -hmm. everyone appreciated his work. Mm -hmm. But Jack Smith is not commodifiable in the same way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. What well, would Richard, you say, Carlo? I would have would said you? David, right? You know, I, I oh, think okay. uh, at least in our circle, there was, uh, and, and say Keith casts the kind of same thing. When people, it, it's not that they're rescued from obscurity, like Jean-Michel, Keith, David Wanarovich, many of these artists, they were really famous in our lives. That's well, true anyone ever heard of them they were like stars so mm. they're they're in a cultural community there is that currency of of being an artist artist like maybe a jack smith is but mm. uh, other than mm. a monster <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, i have a question here uh i wonder how there could be solidarity with indigenous groups in south africa america uh, south america sorry uh most have a, uh, HVI, many have fled to Brazil, yet there isn't any help. So this is- Yeah, well, so the global problem is because of corporate greed and, you know, uh, international pharmaceutical companies, this is the thing, we were able to beat HIV, but we couldn't beat capitalism. So there are treatments. If you are infected today and you have access to health and care, you can live a normal lifespan, but you have to take a medication every day. But because of the greed of international pharma, these drugs are not available at the level that they should be. And some countries manufacture generics, but it's really a problem of capitalism. And thank you so much for bringing that up. It's one of our grad students asking that question, both of those questions, in fact. So happy yeah, to see that. You know, in Brazil, it's also a failure of, of the government that, that you know, Brazil actually had a really strong vaccination program. And, and a lot of those generic, the generic drugs that people outside the United States and Europe 
Yeah, for HIV, we're all manufactured in India and in Brazil. And, and, you know, if it weren't for corporate greed and, and these, you know, like horrible, you know, right wing governments like, you know, Trump and Bolsonaro, the, um, the situation could, could be much better. And, you know, uh, you know, yeah. yeah. Uh, situation could be much better for sure yeah uh, can, uh, can you all read this uh, i'll try not to mess it up can you speak to the u equals u movement in our modern world what do you think uh keeps people from understanding and advertising u equals u can you explain what that means yeah i think you're doing a good job advertising it but it's new to me Eliza, can you explain what that what U equals U? Oh, U equals U means undetectable means untran equals untransmissible. Okay. So oh. if, if people people who have HIV who are on the meds um, are um, um, the the, you, the uh, virus is not detectable in their bodies, and therefore um, when they have sex with another person, they can't transmit. The virus. So one of the the ways that people are trying to, you know, stop HIV in its tracks is to promote this notion that that having sex with a person who is undetectable is safe sex. Okay. Yeah. Let me comment on this because yeah. I've written quite a bit about HIV criminalization. In my most recent book, which was called Conflict Is Not Abuse. I have a huge section on HIV criminalization as a global phenomena, looking at it in Canada. And that's, this is where people who are positive, even if they're undetectable, can be criminalized for having sex, even though they are biologically incapable of infecting the other person. Mm -hmm. And what this reveals is that there's a stigma attached to HIV that is completely unrelated to the reality of HIV. Today, there are so many diseases that are so much worse than HIV, you know, but the, because HIV is associated in the public mind with anal sex between men and, and IV drug use, the stigma, it's queered. Mm -hmm. And so the stigma con continues and governments want to punish and hurt people with HIV. Mm -hmm. But the, the irony is that having sex with someone who's positive but on meds is probably the safest way to have sex if you're afraid of HIV. Whereas mm. somebody who doesn't know their status, there's there's more question there. So it's mm. that the reality is actually the flip of the stigma. Amazing. Listen, I just wanna um, say to people that are listening out there, of course, go and see United in Anger, but I also wanna point out that there's a wonderful website that Sarah and Jim have put together in, a correlation to the film that has, you know, if you want to talk to your children about these issues or your family, there's a lot of um, exercises you can do and a lot of resources and information. It's a really wonderful site that you've created and um, also the ACT UP oral history site, which we look forward to. Jim, do you know when that's going to going to be finished? Um, I'm hoping May, but maybe June, you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure, I'm sure yet. Yeah. Um, yeah, That's but unitedanger.com and actuporalhistory.org. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just want to say our website has had 14, sorry, our website has had 14 million hits. So I just want to let people know that two people can do a lot. <laughs> Don't feel like you need 100 people to do something. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm sure at least 100 of those hits were mine because I go back to it quite <laughs> often. <laughs> Um, just such a thrill to have you here today with us and to speak about these like really important important issues, especially in relation to Keith Haring. And I'm really glad that we were able to, you know, end the series that Carlo began with all these multifaceted issues about Keith's practice and life. Thank yeah. you. And, and yeah, and thanks to all of you. Uh, really, thanks to everyone who's been able to tune into these. Uh, it's been. Uh, been really great for me to, to learn so much. Yeah. Uh, and I would say that, uh, you know, if you hit the red button, you can subscribe to MCA Denver's, uh, you know, YouTube channel and see all the stuff they have up. And the show is up for, you know, I think until mid-August or something. So 
Uh, you should, uh, you know, you can go to the site to book tickets uh, or even see the show virtually. And, and thanks again for, to everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.